everybody. Welcome to Magic is Real. I'm your host, Shannon, and I am very happy today to have with me Jim Bubba Bay. Jim is a regular person, a human being who had a very extraordinary experience. He had a near-death experience, and he's here to speak about that and the insights that he's gleaned. I thank you so much for being here. Do you go by Jim or do you go by Bubba? Bubba works or Jim works, either one. Okay. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I'd Thanks. love to I'd love to start by just asking you about you, who you are, what your childhood might have been like as it pertains to your spiritual journey or evolution. I would love to know um anything you're comfortable sharing about you. All right. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me. And I'm so uh, happy. As you said, my name is Jim Bubba Bay, and I'm pretty much been a lifelong New York resident, other than one year in Arizona. But uh, anyway, it's been uh, you know a great state to grow up in and stuff. I live in the country, which is uh, kind of more my style. We have yeah. one traffic light in our whole town, you know, <laughs> so it's kind of tiny. But yeah, anyway, so uh, growing up, we moved up. Uh, we we lived down in Westchester County, which is more you know populated and um my dad had a gas station uh he bought a gas station up he, about a half hour south of where i where pine plains is and uh he ended up having he would drive like an hour and something every night after like 12 hours at the station and he had an accident on the parkway and he uh hit a a, a tree and lucky to be alive uh it, it it's one of those accidents that if he was wearing a seatbelt he would be dead now Mm -hmm. But thankfully, he didn't have a seatbelt because he bounced into the passenger seat and the steering wheel went to the driver's seat and it pinned his knee. So he's one of those seatbelts save more lives than hurt. But he's one of those that thankfully he wasn't wearing a seatbelt. You know, way back in the day, he didn't. there was no rule for it anyway. So my, why I bring that up is that's what moved us up to Pine Plains. And my, mo my mom and dad brought a house and it was one of those houses 1865, I believe the house is, wow. and it had uh, uh, plaster and lath, and they wanted to re, they had no insulation, so they wanted to redo the house. So prior to moving to Pine Plains, we went to church every Sunday when we lived, uh, up until I was five, when we moved to when I was five. So we went to church every Sunday, we did Sunday school and everything like that. Then we moved here and we started still doing the same thing. We went to the Methodist church. And, and was going to church fairly regularly in the beginning. And then it was decided that the house really needs to be remodeled. Well, there's three kids, me, I'm the youngest, my brother, John, the middle, and my, my sister, Diane is the older, and my mom and dad. So we ended up taking every Sunday because my dad worked six, six days a week and the only day he had off was Sunday to remodel the house. So we busted every wall took every wall down, put insulation on. My whole point to that is that I lost track of church. We didn't go. And then we turned into, and that's, uh, I call it that because we went to church on Christmas and Easter. Uh, we oh, wait, say it again, because you just froze for a second. Yeah, we went to uh, Christ or Christian. Uh, gotcha. You know, so yeah. Christmas and Easter. Uh, and that's what we did. And uh, so in all that, I, I uh, believed in God. I, I, I always had faith. I always believed God was real or higher power and stuff like that. And uh, But I didn't learn the Bible. I didn't know the Bible. Uh, so when I got older, I, I uh, continued not to know the Bible. I didn't really go to church before I um, got hurt, my NDE. And um, the reason why I don't know the Bible or I didn't know the Bible was I always argue not argue but question other people about if it's really god's word why is all this death and dying uh in the bible and then also why is all this death and dying because of the bible you know throughout the years and years in history and history so how can it be really god's word if god is peace and love and, and light and happiness and all that so i it, it kept me from reading the bible you know it really did i i i, I questioned it like that so but that's about, and then I, I just, you know, that's who I was. Uh, I, I became a landscaper with my brother and 
I, we have the gas station still, and I was a, you know, and I, I'm a big hobbies metal detecting. So I love doing that. That's my big passion to doing. Now I've been doing it 38 years. And I was just uh, a guy. And then I had my, um, at the time, for, you know, I was married and stuff and, and I got married and we had two older, my, my two older boys were my twin sons. Uh, they, they they didn't know their dad. They're like my step, you know, I'm a stepdad to them. And then we had, um, but one of them passed away, Robert. And then I had a son, James, who passed away. And then my daughter, Lauren, so, and my son, Logan, both, you know, were born and lived. They all, they were all early uh, pregnancies, Logan, Lauren, and James. And then Robert ended up having kidney disease and died at 18. James died at 10. So my faith was tested, but it, it, it um, I didn't never blame God for any of, any of that. I just, um, I've always been a believer that things happen for a reason. And that's, you know, that was my thought. Uh, but I really, but F, based on all that, I really wasn't um, too spiritual. You know, I, I, I believed I, when people said things, I, I, I never really didn't doubted anybody. I never doubted NDEs. I never doubted anything, but I really wasn't very spiritual of, of a person. I didn't, um, I didn't know anything about the other stuff like um, shamans. I, I, I heard the word, but I didn't know anything about it or, or um, Akashic records or, or, you know, that whole realm of like Reiki healing or Reiki healing and, you know, and law of attraction. I, I didn't even know about any of that stuff. So I was just your regular old kind of guy, just kind of living life. I believe in all the NDEs. I really did. Um, I didn't really look for them if if I happened to hear about it it piqued my interest but I didn't like explore or watch a movie because of it or, or watch it you know an interview about it but I didn't I never denied any that it, any of it wasn't real I, I always believed that there was you know something and that people really do experience that kind of stuff right yeah thank you so much for sharing that uh, I can imagine I know that losing a child is probably the worst thing that can that can happen in terms of grief and it, it does sort of pique my interest that you said uh, I'm sure you went through all the pain and the grief but also that you just had this sort of innate understanding of acceptance or or like this innate acceptance in a, in a strange way I'm sure it was not all that easy um, but I think for people to have that feeling is pretty rare especially during that time I've had friends lose a child or, or who said I've just lost all my faith at that point I, I what, what happened for me is uh I of course I was devastated I mean my what happened was my my one son Logan was born then me and my wife at the time we even though we had this my steps they were like they, they what I loved is I told my John and Robert to call me Jimmy and then when they would meet somebody like you they would say my hey my dad's coming to pick us up so it was like the perfect combination for me I, I, I never wanted, they never met their father, but I never wanted to replace their father. I just wanted to be, you know, a dad to them. So it was yeah. great. And, and I love them to death. And, uh, but my wife and I had Logan and, and my, he's 26 now. And, uh, and that, and then we were like, oh, it's kind of, it's kind of having your all, eggs all in one basket, like between us, you know, that we only have one biological child. So we're like, well, let's have another child. And then we'll, we'll call it quits. Four kids is enough, you know? And uh, so we, we, you know, we, James was, um, you know, he, he became, you know, but he, he was only uh, 23 and a half weeks in gestational period. And he, he actually was premature. Uh, he was only a pound, four ounces. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never said this in another interview, but it really, um, boy, it really hit home. And it really was an amazing thing. At that age, he had a head of hair. He had uh fingers long fingers toes everything uh except his eyes were closed you know they weren't open yet so i never got to see you know the color of his eyes i'm assuming they were brown based on his hair but what on I, I got blue eyes i don't know but anyway that's the only thing but I, it was an amazing thing is that but it was devastating uh and he lived 10 days and he died and, and but looking back at it this is also looking back on it at the time it, it's all painful but looking back on it, uh, at the same time that James was sick and uh, my, one, my wife was in one hospital from a C-section, my 
some was in the other hospital in neonatal natal, natal care and uh, Logan was home with John. My, my other kids were home. So everybody was like three ways and I was being pulled around all. And I managed, you know, I did what I had to do, but we didn't know Robert had kidney disease, but he had it since birth. So I, we would have done what we had to do because that's what we did. That's how my wife and I, at the time, you know, that's who we are. That's who she is. We're, we're apart now, but at the time we were together and uh, she's a tough woman and, and she just, you know, do we would do, but it would be a lot uh, to handle James because they told us there was a really good odds that he was going to be, you know, a special needs child. Uh, maybe we get extremely lucky and he wouldn't need anything, but yeah. because he was born so young and everything, there, there might be some deficits and stuff. And then Robert turned into a full-time job. He was like 12 years old or something like that. And it became like a full-time job with him and his kidney disease. Uh, so as I moved along, I realized like it was almost like God saying, well, if you're, and I, I didn't say God killed my son James, but it's just like the universe said, well, you, you, you already got one sick son. You just don't know about it. So we're going to peacefully, and James would have a rough life maybe, so we'll peacefully let him pass away because before you know it, you're going to have a full-time job on your hand. And that's part of how I approach it, and I approached it. I do have a room, I've never said this in an interview, I do have a room in my head where they uh, reside, mm -hmm. and I just don't open the memories sometimes. I, that's how I get through it too. I have mm -hmm. the door shut. And I try not to open them very often, if I whatever. I mean, sure, I think there's one road. Uh, we had to go to Albany with Robert, which was an hour and 10, 15 minute ride because it, he's a, he was a, a pediatric kidney patient. It was the closest hospital that, that did that. And there's one road called Everett Road on Interstate 90. It's an exit. And I go by it with my son. We take trips. And as soon as I see that exit sign, because that's the exit we would get off to go to the hospital, it's just the memories come flooding back. So yeah. it, it, it still bothers me, but that's kind of how I, uh, but I never did blame God because one of the reasons why I didn't I, um, is see my dad's father died of a heart attack when my dad was 16 and my dad became the man in the family and did, he, he would uh, work a job, go to school, go to football practice, work a job, go home and give all his money to his mother at 16 years old. So and my dad never blamed God. He, you never heard him once say, oh, God took my father or anything like that. And I never got to meet my grandfather and stuff. So, but I've never heard. So I, it was, I, I learned it from my dad kind of like that. I'm like, you know, I never asked him. I never said, well, aren't you mad or anything like that? It's just the way my dad presented himself. Yeah. So, and I'll, we'll yeah. talk. And I, yeah, I, I, when we talk about to your, your near death, your near death experience, that the reason I ask, I mean, other than just, you know, feeling empathy for you is, uh, I know that, uh, it can be, it can be hard to find meaning. And I don't, when, when someone's lost a child, one of my best friends, just her child was five days old. So it's so hard for people to hear things like that. Um, and in, and I, so I'm interested to see how maybe, uh, you felt or, or if that's changed since you had your near death experience, because I'm of the mind that God doesn't cause things to happen like it's um and yet there's sort of a great and yet our souls kind of choose this greater things that happen in our lives so i'll want to hear you speak about that but i'm going to let you tell your story about oh. how this all happened um sorry my well mike is funny um but yeah i'd love to hear uh the story of, of what happened okay i'll i'll try to make it quick so anyway <laughs> so uh in uh, two, uh, November 15, 2009, I was living, my wife and I split up. We, we finally, uh, with my one son being sick, the other died and all that stuff. That's a lot on a marriage. And also with uh, my one son being sick, uh, there was a lot of medical bills. We had the best insurance, New York State insurance, but there was so many copays. It turned into this like mini mortgage. And anyway, we dev devastatedly got financially ruined in the end. And uh, we lost all our homes, and uh, we uh, we had we had two homes because we wanted to do um, peritoneal dialysis at home, and they came to our one house, and it was a little tiny house, and everybody was so happy. They all had their own little rooms, and it was a little tiny house for five, 
five of us, and it was tight, but we were all, it was our first home ever that we owned together, and the kids each had their own little rooms and stuff, and they came to our house, and they said, you can't do, you got to buy another house. Uh, the, the amount of fluid for the month would take up half your living room, and how would you live and stuff, so the quickest way you buy another house is, it wasn't the plan, but it didn't sell right away. It was rent the other one out and you become landlords and then you move into a bigger home. And that's what we did to be able to do peritoneal home because my wife at the time was, you know, hurt, you know, going back and forth and working nights and all that stuff. It was crazy. Anyway, so we split up. Uh, I lived on Hammertown Road. I moved and my brother and sister-in-law had owned a house that was vacant and I moved in and I didn't know if I really could afford it, but it was an okay rent and was tight for me, but uh, my, I had a room for both of my, uh, John was older at the time, so he was off in college, and, but I had a room for my daughter, Lauren, and my son, Logan, and me, and, and anyway, so, and, and in the process of all that, I, being Bubba, I've always battled weight, you know, I've had my good times and my bad times and stuff like that, and I decided that I was really missing my kids because I, now I'm, now I'm not seeing my kids every day, and uh, I needed to do something, so I decided I would start walking, Every day I would walk like six miles after landscaping all day. And my other thing was I would start metal detecting more again. I, I would go when I was with my kids and mar you know, married, but not as much, you know. So I, I did that. So on November 15, 2009, I was out metal detecting all day. And uh, it wasn't the best of day finds, but it just was a beautiful day. And I came home and my mom and dad were visiting me from Vegas. Uh, they live part-time there, part-time here. They still own their home, but they're like, hey, let's go visit Jim. Let's stay at his house. I'd be like, we're on vacation. And it was the house, you know, the, they, they still own their home to this day. And so anyway, it, so they were here and they went out to visit, uh, have dinner with friends. So I was by myself. Um, I'm a horrible cook. I can't, I can bake like crazy, but I can't cook to save my life. So I made, um, I call it tuna special, not so special tuna meal. And I didn't feel it. <laughs> And I didn't feel well after it was a Sunday night and I didn't feel well. And I, and I knew if I went and laid down, it wasn't going to, I was going to roll around. So I said, well, maybe I'll go out for a little walk. I don't walk around this house. I just moved in not too long ago. It's a dead end road, but you know, there's no street lights and stuff like that, but it's a town road and I'll just walk on the road and I'll walk to the opening where, where the main road is. And there's like a town hall across the way and the lights and all that. So I said, I'll just go walk up there and I'll walk back and they probably feel a little bit just moving around, you know, getting my body moving and stuff. So I started walking out that way. And the next thing you know, um, it was nighttime and uh, I came ac across, there was a car on the side of the road and I, I really believe they were drunk and they were going to the bathroom on the side of the road, not the driver, just the passengers and stuff. And I didn't want to scare them. And I didn't want them, you know, I already knew they were there because I could kind of hear them, see them, but I didn't want to just show up and scare them. And, uh, you know, what went through my mind is there's happy drunks and there's not so happy drunks mm -hmm. and you don't know what kind you're going to get, you know? So I, I, it made me turn around. So I turned around, so I didn't go as far as I wanted to. And then I said, well, I'll go past my house. So I went down past my house. I never really walked down that way. And I said, you know what? I mean, this is my thought. What's going to happen? I go down the hill a little bit, turn around. I come back up the hill and I go back and I lay down and I had gas in my stomach and all that, you know? So I thought I'd move around. So I went past my house, ended up going past my neighbor's house. I never met the woman personally, but it was a neighborly way because I was new to the road and she had been here. But when she would go by, I'd be like, oh, that's, you know, now I didn't know her. I, I knew her name because we actually helped her mow her lawn a couple of times, but I didn't know her personally. And I don't, she know my, I don't think she knew my name was Jim or whatever like that. So I went past her house and then I was like, you know, that's good enough. So I turned around. And I went across the street because I always walk against the traffic, especially at night, you know, and stuff. And uh, so I called across the street and then I saw lights that I thought was car lights. And often because we have a big entrance because it's the landscape shop in the house, people come down and they turn around and then they leave back out going on my dead end road. So I thought it was car lights. So I saw car lights. I don't think the car came down. I really do think it turned around, but I, I, I don't know because. I moved to my left to get off the road and stop because you don't keep walking towards a car when they're coming towards you. And I, I slipped. And if it was, if where I fell wasn't, if it was just the ground or even a little dent, 
I would have fallen on the ground. I would have probably laughed and I would have got up and went home. Well, I ended up flipping and I fell to my left. My head went left. And next thing you know, I'm pre-falling uh, into like a black hole. And I don't know what, it, it just, it was so fast and so furious that I don't know where I was going. I mean, it was quick. And uh, I, I ended up falling 14 feet into a formal culvert and I landed on rock. I hit my head first. Uh, hit my left shoulder, my left rib cage area, and then my legs, my left legs. My right side never hit the ground, just my left. And I ended up breaking four ribs on the right side from the impact without hitting the ground. It was incredible. So I was unconscious. I don't know how long I was unconscious. Uh, time for all this, I have no idea. I can't tell you how, this, you know, but overall I was unconscious for second, two seconds, 10 seconds, a minute. I don't know. I did come to, I realized that uh, I felt this liquid, which ended up being blood, and uh, I was bleeding bad, and I took my right arm, and I reached across my head, and my fingers went in my skull, mm -hmm. and uh, then I knew I was in trouble. I already felt the pain, but I, I, I had the wherewithal to say, okay, head injury, you know? So I proceeded to then start to... It, it, the one thing that amazes me is the amount of thought I had in this whole process that I could still think. And my first thought was, I couldn't think of how I got hurt yet. I couldn't, it didn't come to me right away, but I did remember I had my cell phone. Then I remembered, this is back in the day, I had a flip phone. Well, unless somebody really, really called you in that little window, it's, it's not going to light up. There's, it would be so hard to get it to light up. So right away, I decided that was a waste of my time to look for my phone. And the other thing that I thought of was that cell service is horrible around here. So the odds of it working are horrible. So I started to get worse feeling. And then, of course, the, the blood mixed with the tears because I started to realize I was in a lot of trouble. And I was started to realize I was very hurt. So then the next thing... They, kicked in and that was to call for help. And uh, again, it's a dead end road. There's not many houses. Sunday, most people are home packing lunches or, you know, taking a shower, getting ready for Monday work. And, you know, some people are probably like depressed because they got to go to work on Monday, you know, that Monday morning feeling. And so, and, and cars don't go by very often. So, but I figured I would call for help. So I yelled out for help. And I do know that I said, please God help me. That was one of my things, and I changed it up. I had the wherewithal to, to change what I was saying a little bit, but I did say, please, God, help me. Please, God, help me, and I yelled out as, though, I yelled out as loud as I could, which I thought it was loud, and then after I don't know how many yells, five, ten, I, I don't know how many yells I did, but I realized it was getting softer and softer and softer, and then I realized it was not worth yelling, so... I didn't yell anymore. And the reason why, and I'm not, but I did have 11 broken ribs come to find out and my lungs and just yelling and everything was hurting so bad that I couldn't really do it much more, you know, at a thing. So then for me, and it could be for everybody else, everybody has their own experience, but for me, it's really true. My life started to go and flash in my head a little bit as I was sitting there. And, um, I started thinking of my two boys that had passed away, uh, James and Robert. Now, I don't know if I did enough to go to heaven or, or whatever. I, I, I don't know the rules and whatever, but I don't know if I did enough. But I did think my one son was 10 days old and died. And my other son was 18 years old and died. And if you believe in heaven, the odds of them being in heaven are pretty good. So I started to, you know, get more teary eyed and stuff. And then I thought of my family that's still living. So I was kind of like a torn person on that land and that rock. But again, I don't know if I'm going to heaven to see them. But that's what I was thinking. It was going back and forth. And I, obviously, it was quick enough thoughts that, you know. But then I went back to think about my son, Robert. And he, um, sadly, me and my wife at the time, Yanina, have never talked about what she saw. But it's really, it just kills me inside. But she found Robert dead in his apartment, and he had been dead three or four days. 
So can you imagine a mother finding their son right. or daughter? You know, it's, it's, it's a bad thought. And that came, that thought came to me. Now I've never talked, we never talked. Um, I think it was something we knew never to, it was bad enough knowing he was, you know, passed away. And, you know, we talked about that part, but don't open that door, you know, and go down that road. And if she was wanted to share with me, I'm always, I was her husband. So I'm there to listen if she wanted to share. She knew that, you know, it, it was up to her, but I could never imagine what she saw. So being me who I, my life, I tend to think of others kind of before myself. I, it's just my, who I've been. Uh, it's kind of how I am in a way. I started to think of, wow, I'm really, really bad here. And they're going to have to, I, whoever finds me, it's going to be bad. It's going to be really horrible. And they, they were, might have to get the dogs to find me because I, I literally like, it's like you open the, the uh, black hole. I walked boom and I was gone. I didn't know where I was yet. I still hadn't figured all that out, but I'm like, and then I said, well, I, then I said, oh, where, where did I come from or what happened? And then I started to think a little bit. I'm like, oh, I walked and it kind of was all coming to me a little bit. And then I realized um, it was kind of like to my right a little bit, but I was kind of laying towards it. There's this big wall silhouette of this big wall. And then I was able to turn my neck a little bit because I broke my neck. I was able to turn just a little bit and I saw like a field. And I'm like, hey, some of the stuff I thought about was, it, it was amazing to me because I had a head injury and a brain injury. And here I'm thinking, I'm like, well, you can't get hurt falling in a field, but you can get hurt with a wall. So that's what told me that's where I came from. And then I remembered I was walking. It kind of all... It was kind of like going all like that. So then I said, well, I don't know if I can move because I haven't moved yet uh, other than my arms, but I don't know if I could, maybe I'm paralyzed from the waist down. I, I didn't know at the time. And I said, that's where I got to go. And I got to get to, ended up being the road. I said, the, I figured out, you know, that's where I came from and I could die on the road. I could die near the road and whoever finds me, maybe a car will go by in a half hour and they'll find me. And, you know, and, um, you know, part of it was I didn't want my mom and dad to find me, you know, because they were visiting at the time and I lived on my own, you know, most of the time unless my kids were here. And, um, you know, cause they would have came looking, but they wouldn't have looked for me. So what they had to do, they would have went to town where I usually walk and, you know, it would have been a process. So I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to a road. And then I said, well, if I'm paralyzed, I ain't going anywhere and it doesn't matter. But if I'm not paralyzed, I can try to go to a road. So it turns out I wasn't paralyzed. Obviously, I'm still here and uh, moving. And uh, so I somehow I crawled. And the one thing amazing, it was three. There was one big wall and two little side walls. And somehow I knew to go around the little side wall. To this day, I have no idea how. And because if I kind of crawled forward straight, I would have ran into the little wall, which would have took effort. And then I had to go around, but something, something had me and maybe angels are there or not. I, I don't, I claim I climbed the hill all myself because the pain was through the roof, but people who believe and stuff said there was always, God was always with you and angels and stuff like that. But God, you know, didn't show up yet, or there was no angels that I knew of. So I don't, you know, whatever one of people want to believe is okay with me. But so I ended up getting to the side hill. Now, since the accident, uh, the fall, people of a uh, healthy people have gone down and they tried to climb the hill where I climbed uh, on my, you know, and it's difficult to do. It's not long, but it's steep. So I'll just share what I, and the damage I had is before I climbed the hill, I ended up having a fractured skull, a brain bleed, a concussion, a traumatic brain injury. I broke uh, my left scapula. I broke uh, 11 ribs, seven on the left, four on the right. I broke C7 two ways and I broke from T12 to T1 and I broke nine of those and I broke two of those two ways. So I broke 23 bones with 26 fractures involved with it. So, you know, and then of course, you know, the blood gushing out and everything like that. So I started climbing the hill and I worked my way up the hill like a snake. I, I didn't get off the ground. And thankfully my right arm is my dominant arm and I didn't break that. And my legs weren't broken. They were caught and hurt and, you know, all the, that stuff, maybe bruised. But I was able to shimmy up the hill. I don't know how long it took. I fell back a few times. I cried all the way up the hill. 
And uh, part of that was my family, the other missing my kids and my family, and then all that, the situation I'm in. And the other part was just the outright pain. So I proceeded to get this side of the road because I could see the silhouette of a nice flat kind of thing. And I landed on this log. And this log is a huge part of the whole story. So everybody at night could lay in a log and know it's a log, but can describe the log. So I was on this log. Of course, I couldn't describe it because it's pitch black out pretty much. So I realized I made it. So I decided I'm ready to die. I, I, I was as content in dying as I guess anybody could be. Uh, my faith was gone. There was no hope. I had really no hope of um, living. Uh, even down in the, you know, down in the gully, I had no hope. Uh, the the situation was really bad, and um, my face and it, my tank was empty of everything. But I felt it, it's a weird thing, but I felt like a sense of accomplishment. I made it to the road. It was like my last big thing to do before my life ended. So I laid in the log and I um, closed my eyes because I was done, and the pain was through the roof at that time, and. Uh, I just closed my eyes and was content and dying. Now, I never died. I never claimed to die. I didn't, I didn't die at all. I didn't 100% die. And, and the other thing is I didn't go anywhere. I had an in-body experience, which is, it seems more people have out of body than in-body, but I don't know. It just seems like, but I had an in-body experience and I didn't go anywhere. So I was laying in this log, uh, content and dying. All of a sudden, um, you know, as kids, we, I, this is the way I explain it. We we uh we we oversleep and then our parents turn our bedroom light on and then that light makes our eyes open up. That was what happened to me. I felt this uh, searing like light on the outside of my eyelids and I opened my eyes and it was incredible. The sight I saw, it was just this big bright light and uh, started to see colors and everything and it was just beautiful and it was like kind of surrounding around me and stuff like that and growing bigger and bigger and in this light started this figure started coming towards me and of course I was you know I didn't know what was happening and and the figure got closer and closer I started to say I, am I going to heaven and is this the way they come get you or is this I, I didn't know you know I've never been there of course I never almost died and so that, that was my first thought and then I was like wow maybe I'm going to go to heaven maybe this is the way they do it and uh, so I kind of sat there and you know, of course, I had all that damage, so I couldn't move too much. And I'm like looking, and it gets closer and closer, and ended up being a, uh, ended up being a grandfatherly figure, in a white robe. And what's key to that is, uh, is if it was just the light, Jim Bubba Bay would be dead on that log, because I I wouldn't be able to interpret what I was seeing. There would be no reason for me to go, oh, the light's here to 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 make me feel better and I'm going to live. I, I just would be in a log. I, 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 before I felt my spirituality, you could fit on the size of a great let's say, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I believe, I believe all these things, stuff like that, but I, I, you know, or an orb, like if an orb showed up and nothing else and no figure showed up, I would be dead on the log because I wouldn't understand. I really wouldn't. I would have no clue what was going on and it wouldn't make me want to do anything else because I'm in so much pain. That's what I would be. So, it had to come in a figure for me. Now, the other key to what happened was, as I said earlier, I, I grew up going to church and then not really much church and I don't know the Bible. But to me, you know, God was a grandfatherly, white robe kind of thing. So it had to come to me a way that I could interpret it. Mm -hmm. And it might show up to you or anybody, all different, might be a woman, might be, I, I, I am not an expert on any of this, but it was the only way I could interpret it. And then the other key to what happened was my kids were there, uh, Robert and James. Mm -hmm. and, and you had asked that question. I, I'm, a belie I, I'm a believer in destiny that it's kind of laid out for us. And yes, we, we have free will and we're at the curve and we kind of pick the, pick the, 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 you know, the, at the Y and we pick the one way and the other way would turn out this way and the other way. And we might end up back in the same spot. We don't know that. And we do pick our way, but along the way, there's lessons and things and all that. Or maybe we definitely pick it that way. I don't know for sure, because one of the things that happened for me was, again, James and Robert being 
10 days old and 18 years old, it kind of helped me realize this was from heaven, mm. what I was seeing. It was kind of like their destiny to be there the night I was falling because, you know, I, I, um, it would help me understand what I was seeing. So we ended up having a conversation, like a telepathic within kind of thing, not like we're talking. That's the way it worked for me. Maybe people talk, I don't know. And the other key to the thing is, is that, you know, the people that know the Bible and the Christian, they're really people that know their stuff and say they know their stuff. They say you can't see God. Well, that figure said my son, Jesus. So that's why I claim to meet God. But I always have said that, how do I know? It could be God using Jesus' body right. or something mm -hmm. else to, through, through that, you know, to talk to me. And, and sense what I knew or what I could comprehend. So I, I, I talked to God, whether he, you know, whether it was God, you know, they say or not, that's everybody can interpret their own way. I believe it to be God. That's what I, but they say you can't see God. So what do I know? But that's, that's how I do it. So we, so of course, now we're having a conversation. And the other thing was a brief meeting. I do know that. It was like me and you walking down the road. You know me. We stop. We talk a little bit. And then we go on our way. Because um, that's what it ended up being. But if you, anybody, the one thing that I learned, like if you have a searing question your whole life, and it's like always a doubt, always a question, always a question, like why is the sky blue? Why is the sky blue? Why is it, you know, that question. And you meet God or the higher power or whatever you believe in. Don't you think you're, they're going to answer your if they know the answer and they know you've been thinking that all your life, they're going to answer it for you. And that was one of the biggest things that happened with me is I kind of got told by God about the Bible. And, you know, I kind of was like, you know, the, the death, you know, my same thing I said, that's why I don't know the Bible. And it always bothered me, like all those killings in the Bible and then all this killing over the Bible. How can it be this peaceful word and God's word? And he proceeded to tell me that, as, as you can see, that th those that do that, it's man's interpretation, and they, they do it for their own good and their own power. And they, and, but do you see that eventually those people that do that or groups or whatever, they can be around for 200 years or whatever, but eventually they go out of, they fall out of power, you know? Or whatever, it, it like like it doesn't end very good for them in the end, whatever way it is. And yet, God and the Bible continue on. And I was like, oh, okay, so it's man's interpretation, and mm -hmm. they use it for their own good, you know. And they read it their way, and they interpret it the way they want to interpret it. And they, you know, that group says you got to do this or that. So that's you know that's what I learned. And uh, we had a conversation and uh, there's a couple little private things. That's no big deal. Nothing. Ne no one needs to know. He just kind of answered a little couple little side things. I, I just never shared them. They're just so they're personal. And yeah. but there's nothing to help you out or somebody else. It's just an individual thing. So I've never shared them. And it, it just I keep them to myself and stuff. And uh, he proceeded to, you know, tell me that I have things to do for him. And uh, the amazing thing I forgot to say is I had, prayer, I had found this book, The Prayer of Jabez, and I started reading it back in 06, and it changed my whole prayer life. And what I got from saying the prayer is like, here I am, God, I'm ready to do your work. And I prayed it religiously, and I always wondered what I was going to do for God since I don't know the Bible. I can't quote anybody or make anybody feel good. I can give them a hug if they want or something like that or help them, but I didn't know if that's God's work or not. So I always wondered, you know, what I was, but I prayed, I prayed the day I prayed, I prayed. But the other key, it changed my prayer life that I became a better prayer, prayer of other, for other people and all that. And I kind of did it more religiously. I used to be here and there praying. And I, I never was a great prayer and I couldn't, you know, I just never was good at it, you know, and then it helped me be good. So he said, you got things to do for me. And, and then it started, you know, now I know that it's kind of like I'm doing this work now because that's that's kind of what I was kind of sent off the road to help them out later on. So anyway, yeah, you so we, you and I'll just mention, <clears throat> excuse me, you are a speaker and you also wrote a book about your experience. 
called Miracle on, tell me the name of the street again. On Hammertown Road. On Hammertown Road, which we'll yeah. have a link to below. But yeah, um, yeah so uh, is it, you're doing the work of sharing the message that there is more yeah. to life than this. Yeah, and then to be honest with you, uh, not to sidetrack, but it, it, it's, it's, God always uses the people that are uh, normal. You know, mm -hmm. or whatever, like that. Not that no one's normal. Everybody's normal. To me, everybody's normal. Everybody likes certain stuff and does certain stuff and does some stuff. But no one's special. I'm not special. I'm just Jim Bubba Bay, landscaper, gas station guy. Everybody can relate to me. I, I, yeah. I when I talk, I, um, I've lost two kids. I, I lost all my homes. Never got to sell a home. I lost them all. Not, you know, financial devastation, bankrupt, and foreclosed on all of them. Divorce, you know, divorce, lost the, you know, and. Uh, and I almost died myself. Oh, and by the way, I broke 26 fractures. So, you know, and I got a brain injury. I'm the, I am the most blessed brain injured person you ever want to meet, though. I am so highly functioning that I am so blessed, you know, to be yeah. as highly functioning as I am. I have deficits. If you hang around me a long time, you'll see a few of them. But, you know, that's, uh, but that's who, you know, that's who I am. So after he left, but he didn't tell me, you know, he went away. I never did talk to my son, James or Robert. They mm -hmm. were just there. Um, and all these figures were kind of solid. They weren't this ghostly kind of like mm -hmm. I could see through them. They, to me, they were solid. But I think that's what I needed. I don't know if you would, you know, if, if the same thing happened to you or somebody else, it might be ghostly to them people. Because I also wasn't a big ghost guy. And the incredible thing is, is that I believe in ghosts and they don't scare me no more. Not like that. You know, like I, it's it's just the next life and all you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. all that has changed in me. So after he left, I uh, I was on this log and while he was there, this log is important. I was able to see I was on this log that had no bark and no branches. It was an old log and it looked like a telephone pole. And I was like, okay. And I was able to move it up and I'm like, wow, you know, I you know I'm on this log. So it just became ingrained in my head. So after he left and my kids followed, uh, it got all dark and the pain was, the pain never left when I was with him and my kids. I was just in so awe that I couldn't think about myself or my pain or whatever like that. And the blood was still flowing. He didn't stop it or make, but what made the pain go away when I was there and it wasn't really away. It just, my, my brain went to what I was experiencing and not what I was feeling. So I, uh, I said, okay, that's, I mean, I did say this and it's kind of a joking way, but I kind of, I didn't say it the exact way, but okay, God said, I'm going to live, but what am I going to do now? How am I going to, you know, he didn't say taxi is going to pick me up or right. what's going to go by, you know, what, what happens now? I'm supposed to live, but I'm on this dead end road in the dark. Um, it was pitch black again, pretty much. It ended up being foggy that night. So it got worse. And uh, I know it's symbolic, but I was able to turn my neck just a little bit. And I saw this little, little tiny light on in this window. And I know it's symbolic, but that's what I said. I got to go. The only thing that I could see was this one little light, and that's where I got to go. So um, it looked, it was far away. It looked far away. And it was like, to me, it was miles away, but it wasn't. And uh, so I said, okay. And then I said, if I crawl, I die. I don't care what God says. By the time I got to that place, my, I would be bled out or whatever like that. So I said, okay, well, I got to walk. Of course, I didn't know I had all those fractures and all those broken bones. I just know I was really hurting. So I started climbing. I, I got up on my knees and then I got up on my feet and I fell right back down. And what it was was gravity took over and it was the first time all these broken bones were in the air all by themselves and I couldn't take the pain. So I fell. So I rebraced myself and I said, I'm going to die if I crawl and I got to walk. So I, I said, but I can't fall again because I couldn't get back up. The energy would be too much. So I got up on my feet and I hunched over and I kind of shuffled my feet all the way down the road. Um, that's another blessing I've never said, but thankfully the road was the road and I was able to shuffle on the road and I wasn't walking through a field or high grass or something like that. So I shuffled my feet, ended up getting to what ended up being my neighbor's house that I passed. And uh, she had a little hill on the front you on. It, lo it looked like Mount Everest to me at the time, but it's this tiny little hill, but it looked like Mount Everest because I had to climb it, you know? And it's tiny. It's it's kind of embarrassing to say that, but it's really tiny hill. But anyway, it took a lot of effort to climb this little hill. 
And I got to her door and I knocked on her door and she opened her door and um, she ended up writing for the book, her, her experience oh, wow. from her end. Anyway, she, when I asked her to write for the book, she said, kind of like um, a symbolic way of saying she was scared for her life and yeah. she thought like Freddy Krueger was in the neighborhood. That's I'm bad. surprised she opened the door. Yeah, well, that was the scary part too. And that she got scared, you know, and stuff like that because here I am, a bloody mess. But through all that blood, she recognized I was her neighbor. And uh, I don't know whether I said, can you call 911? Or she said she called 911. She ran up to get the phone. She came back and I wasn't there no more because I passed out. I did my job. At that point, I said, I really did my job. I did what I had to do. And, but I, I never really became unconscious totally. I just was going in and out, in and out. And uh, of course, you know, she called 911, the fire truck came, the ambulance, then another ambulance. And I was hurt so bad, they were going to fly me in a helicopter, but it ended up being too foggy. Uh, so they had to um, take me in an ambulance and the ride was, it was the worst and best ride of my life. The pain was through the roof when I was in there. I almost, I almost punched out in the ambulance. The pain was through the roof and I couldn't take it no more. I almost said, I'm done, uh, take me kind of thing. But I managed, um, they took an, it was over an hour to get me off the lawn. Uh, I supposedly, I, uh, to get me on the backboard cause they, I had a head injury. So right away and they were right. I had all these broken bones in my back and neck, but, uh, it took them over an hour to get me on the backboard. And I screamed at every, I mean, everybody, that, you know, was there. And my, um, my cousin, Rich, uh, he was, a, he just, he, he retired sheriff now. At the time, he was on the, you know, a patrol, and he was in another town. And he had a new crew. They came just for the ride to see what was going on, and uh, he got within, I think, probably five, ten feet, and he never recognized it was me. On the, and I'm his first cousin. That's how bad I was. That's how wrecked I was that he couldn't recognize me that I'm his cousin, you know. And uh, anyway, he followed my blood trail and he found where I fell, and they called him. They called the hospital and said, oh, "This is way worse than we thought." And he free fell down this big, you know, ravine and stuff. So I got to the hospital to induce the coma after the first day, because I wasn't going to live. I guess they didn't make a pain med strong enough to stop my pain. Um, and I was in a coma. And that was a whole different world. Drug induced, but it was a whole different world. Uh, I had a, the most friendliest scarecrow friend you ever want to have in my coma. And I visited him every day when I was in my coma. And we would have lunch. Uh, we would talk about our kids and sports and it was current stuff. It was like, wow. that I last knew happened. And he really, um, yeah, I stayed with him. He did his job. He had lawn chairs. He, you know, he wasn't this typical That's guy. So and, Interesting. I always yeah, wonder yeah. like what, I mean, obviously everyone's experience is different, but what it's like to be in a coma because coma, because sometimes people have actual out of body experiences while they're co in coma. Others don't remember anything. It's all black. Others might have sort of dreams or hallucinations. Yeah. Um, and I mean, who knows about the scarecrow, right? Like it could be yeah. a projection, but also maybe some sort of like spirit friend. What yeah, do you they, think? Well, yeah. To me, it was friendly. I did another talk on a Christian thing and one of the comments, everybody comments their own stuff and I don't care whatever, you know, they comment, they, it's their free will to comment what they want, but they were like scarecrow. That's got to be the devil of hell. Oh, and I'm like, no. that's, the, it, it was the most friendliest scarecrow. His name was Sam. He had a <laughs> name. He had kids. And we literally would, I would eat with him. We, you know, of course, I'm not eating nothing in the coma. I'm in, you know, feeding tube, breathing tube and everything. And, and uh, I would have lunch and we would eat lunch together. And did I mean, it I feel hours there. It was it real. Feel real, real? Could be. That's what it I mean. Real. Like, yeah. And, and then it, it was as real as real could be. And then I, I didn't share this in the book because it's more dark, this stuff. But in this whole process, I thought there was two nurses trying to kill me. And when, when I wasn't hanging out with Sam and stuff, and I thought they had it in for me. And eventually I was in one of those, the hospital I was in, and I didn't even know I was in a hospital. This, this was just thoughts I had. The hospital I was in had, um, uh, they had too many people. So I was in a trailer and they were so upset and so mean to me that they finally gave up and they hooked the trailer up like with a Brady bag on station wagon and wood sides and they drove them away with me in the trailer. That was, you know, I went from that to 
my friend Sam, but most of the time I spent with Sam and it wasn't too dark, but that was the darkest thing I was thinking at the time. And it was obviously all drug induced and stuff like yeah. that. But um, it really did. It really helped me pass the time, I guess you're saying. But it was, for me, it was as real as real could be. It was my life. I was like, and, and at the time, I, I never thought about this life. The whole time, I've never said that before. I don't even think I shared in the book, but I never thought I'm um, Jim Bubba Bay and I got kids and this and that. Um, I did, did, did I talk about my kids? I might've talked about my kids or something like, oh, I got kids, but I don't even know if I named them or stuff like that. But mostly it was like, I was like a whole, you know, I was a father. I did. I was a father and stuff like that. I kind of, but I didn't like get so detailed about me in a way, you know? And right. um, he kind of like, shared his stuff and he, he kept me up to date. I told him, sadly, I'm a Met fan. I didn't say that sadly to him at the time. And he would come and tell me Met, Met scores. And, you know, I don't know if there were really games going on then, but that's the kind of stuff in sports and politics. And I'm not a big political guy, but we would talk politics and think of what we want to think and stuff. That's so interesting. I'm really curious to know what that's about, right? Because it does sound like that's, you know, you're in a coma, you're actually not dead, you're you're alive, and you're having what could be called hallucinations. And I'm sure that there are people that are like, well, if that's a hallucination, then was also seeing your children, you know, seeing your children and God, was that also a hallucination? Well, and here, yeah, that's what I want to ask you. Yeah, go ahead. Well, here's the key to that. Every, every, to me, every, every NDE has a, one of those aha uh -huh moment hmm you know one of those moments like um like 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 the heaven's real i've never read the book and stuff like that but um you know he came back to tell his parents about aunt and uncle or aunt that he he didn't know existed himself never got told and so how did he know he was a young child how did he know so there's always an aha moment so when i woke up out of the coma i was like 99 percent sure you know that i met god at this log so when I finally, because they, finally they worked me out of a coma out like seven days or whatever like that. And um, so I ended up uh, coming out and then, but it, when I finally was able to, because I had the breathing tube in me and stuff for a while and finally took it out and I could talk, I finally decided to tell my family that I met God at a log. So, and it, I didn't care who came in because at the time it was, um, you know, I was still in the intensive care like the critical intensive care where they, it's all glass. There's no walls. So they can see all the time. That's the room. I, I never knew I was in that room. That's how bad I was. I never knew. I never was up to turn around to look and everything like that. I just never knew I was in that kind of room. My family had to tell me that. Anyway, so I proceeded to tell my family one at a time. Whoever came in, didn't matter, my sister, brother, I just told them. And they all said, you got to be sure. And I said, well, I told him I met God at a log and I was laying on this log and I said it has no bark and no branches and the one thing that they said to me that made it like okay now it's 99.2 percent sure is they said there was a lot of blood at a log I right. must have stopped at a log so that made it okay now I'm like 99.2 percent sure it happened and then um why I was in a coma in the hospital my niece Genesis found out about this great website karenbridge.org mm -hmm. and, and it's and it's yeah you know it's so yeah you know where they where you can make a page for the sick people or the herd or whatever like that and uh, they made a page for me so they proceeded to make this page and everybody signs on with their email and then john and mary and my brother and sister well they were the ones that kept it updated and stuff so they updated and they would come in when i finally could talk and hear hey jim you got 10 more fans and Two, 10 more messages, two, you know, and they would keep me updated. And all over the world, people were contacting, you know, some people that I know live all, you know, all over the world. And uh, so when I was in rehab, they had little computers, they had computers for the patients. I was in a, a senior citizen slash rehab center. So um, one floor was all rehab and then the rest was all senior citizens and stuff. And, and I, uh, there was like a, place you could take your patients or whatever or things could go be on a computer so one day john and mary Ann were visiting me and stuff and they said hey you want to go see your webpage finally and i i said yeah okay yeah that's great i'll go so we went down and they wheeled me in a wheelchair and uh, we went there and they read it and my neighbor 
wrote this most powerful message about God must have been there to help save my life. She had no idea I met God and she included it in her message. And um, it was, I cried, I cried. And then my brother proceeds to say to me, hey, you wanna see where you fall? I said, I didn't know if I was ready. I really didn't, because it really changed my whole life. It was traumatic, you know? And I said, okay. And he opens up the photo. It was taken the day after, that morning after I fell, like Monday morning. And in the picture is the log I described straight out of a coma that I met God at. And what's key about that is it's a dead end road, no, no street lights, no house lights near there, no car lights because they would have helped me on the side of the road, no moonlight because it was foggy, so it couldn't fly me, and there's no sunlight because it's, you know, at 7, 30, 8 o'clock at night. So there's only one light it could be that lit that up that I could see the kind of log I was laying on. Right. And it, there it is. And I still have the pictures to this day. I have a whole stack. They, they, I, I, matter of fact, I had them in a drawer and I totally forgot. And like, I don't like last year, I, I've been hurt. It's been four, 14 years now. And I op- I'm like, what's this? This is, and I open it up and there's the pictures and there's the log where I met God at. And wow. I described it straight out of a coma. Yeah. So, and, and the other key to this thing is, if you don't believe me, I'm okay with it. Yeah. See, because the one thing that I, I especially like those NDEs, and I'm not saying it because this is that's kind of like what mine is. I really like those NDEs where people do this incredible stuff all on their own, and they end up living. And if you don't believe they had what they claim help or you know divine intervention, uh, that means they did it all themselves. And that's mine. It was me. And I've, I've had non-believers and I talked to them and they come back and they're like, you know, I really can't believe now that because your story. And either way, I, I, they followed my blood trail from the culvert to my neighbor's house. I knocked on her door. Now, if you believe that I don't, if you don't believe I had divine intervention, I met God or whatever like that, then you're saying I did it all myself. But either yeah. way, it's fact. So, right. And it's your experience. So I, I yeah. and everyone's is different. So um, that's, I really appreciate you sharing yours and um, just kind of wanted to know, I know that you already had some faith, but overall, how did this change your perception or your perspective on life, why we're here um, and what's really going on on the other side? I know that we don't, you didn't go all the way over, but uh, what what kind of, and, I, and also I want to touch on, you said that there was telepathic communication, which everyone pretty much tells me i mean almost yeah. everyone and as a medium that's how i interpret that's how i receive information from the other side is obviously i don't hear a voice i think it it's like i hear it in my head right, so right. um it, they but but on the other side or if you want to call it that it goes even faster like you said they don't sit there and take time to explain it's just like the knowledge is all of a sudden in your head and you just know it so yeah, yeah i'd love to hear just sort of how it has changed your 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 worldview, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one thing it's done is before I before I had my ND and all that stuff, I was a shy guy. If I knew you, I'd talk your ear off. I've been a talker all my life, but I had to get to know you. Before I fell, I uh, I was scared of using the phone. Forty four year old guy, and I wouldn't even call the book a motel room. Mm-hmm. I always left it to my wife. I, I I I was a baby. I'm not gonna. Growing up, I was the baby of the family. I treated the baby. And, I was a baby and stuff. Now my friends are shocked because I do talk to her often before this, and I was friends, and I I be friends with anybody, you know. And uh, but you had to be in my class, and I had to get to know you, or you know something like that. It had to be that kind of. I wouldn't go up to a stranger and talk to him. I'm afraid of all that and all that stuff. So since that, I become 180 degrees. Um, I I I got the gift of sociability, I call it, mm-hmm. because I talked to everybody. I'm not afraid. I've done three TV shows and um, I, I didn't know I was on TV. I do interviews, I do inspirational speaking. So that alone has just blown my world up. Another thing that happened, I had a book event at a cafe that um, it, it was, they, uh, sadly COVID closed it down. And, but anyway, uh, my friend Joe, I didn't know him at the time, but we had met in past lives because he sent a message on Facebook and said, hey, I, you know, my friend read your book. I want to have an author event. You sell books, I sell coffee. 
So I went and the first time I met the guy, we hugged each other. We mm -hmm. never met each other before. So it, it just felt that way. So anyway, we became, you know, so we became great friends after that too. But um, so we had the book event. It was standing room only. I don't know where these people came from. People behind me, it was packed and all that stuff. And then we had another event. But anyway, when you, I've always been there since day one. My, as soon as I learned and my parents said, people do for you, you do for them. Whatever way you can return the favor. So how do you return a favor to that? Well, I don't like coffee, but it's a coffee shop. Well, you learn to like coffee. So I started to go and like coffee and I started drink coffee. Anyway, he had all these events. And why I bring that up is um, like you with the mediumship and stuff. I didn't really know all that stuff. I really didn't. That's how, remember my spirituality is a grape, right? Size of a grape before this. Well, there ended up being a uh, Akashic record um, stuff. Uh, Reiki Halen, Reiki Halen, um, Intenders, uh, Law of Attraction, uh, you name it, all these events, they would go like classes and stuff like that. And so I would start to go to them because one, I would drink coffee and eat a little something sometimes. And they were like 10 bucks to go to the class. Well, it just 10 bucks more that helps him or whatever like that. So, but then I started meeting all these people and learning all this stuff and all, it just blew up. My whole spirit, uh, shaman, I never knew what a shaman was. I, I heard of it, but this is how naive I was, I guess. And, Next thing you know, a shaman and all that stuff. So through all that, I, I just, my whole, you know, spiritual life has blown up. Uh, and, and one of the big things that I learned, and I've said it before, and some people have responded, is I don't know the Bible. Like I said, I kind of learned some stories, but I still don't know the Bible. I still couldn't quote you a scripture that saved your life, to help you, or anything like that. But what I do know, since I learned about the law of attraction, and I've heard stuff quoted from the bible to me the law the number one law of attraction book ever written is the bible wow it, explain that it's it's um it, it's kind of the way joel olstein does his stuff mm -hmm. but it's like think positive positive things happen think negative negative things happen so you think positive and there's this really great thing and it was i don't know where i heard it uh I don't, I don't take no claim to fame of this stuff, but I don't know where I heard it, but uh, they, it was a great saying. I, I share it with others because to me, it's amazing. If you worry, you're, you're praying for the bad stuff to happen. If, oh, that's wow. all you, if that's all you concentrate on and that's what you worry about, the bad stuff happened. And I have a great example in my own life. I share it. It's very personal. I had, I had this money saved up to help me get through life. And I made really bad decisions with money and gone, poof, gone. And it was a good substantial amount that most people would rock their world. What rocked my world it made me real depressed. And all as I could think about was money, like mm -hmm. losing money. Yeah. Well, the, since that's all I thought about, the universe said, all right, you're going to lose, well, we'll make sure you lose more money. And I lost more money. I, left an envelope someplace with all this money in it and I just lost it. And then I am, um, I'm a single guy and stuff. And I, I, I haven't paid for no dating site, but then all of a sudden this one site I signed up four years ago, whatever, somebody contacted me and it sounded legit, talked on the phone, everything. And it was a scam mm -hmm. and there's more money gone. Right. Yep. Call me naive, call me, you know, but I was scammed. So that's all I could think about. And was losing money, and the universe says, okay, you, that's all you can think about, losing money. So you got to think positive. And when bad things happen, and I'm not perfect, I've made a lot of mistakes. And the other thing I want to say is what I learned, and I've always believed this, but just because you meet God or you have these experiences doesn't make you any better than anybody else. And it doesn't make life that much any easier than, that, or, you know, because bad things still happen and good things still happen. But what I've learned, from all this is that you take the bad thing the best you can and and you there's 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 always something there that it could be worse it could have been worse and mm -hmm. stuff like that like my mom has stage four cancer right now and uh we all could have been like oh, oh my god and, but i'm like you know what for me I, I was like you know just treat my mom like my mom and stuff like that and she'll 
you know, do the best she can. She's 83, 84 years old and stuff. She's lived a good life already. And uh, my mom's doing great. I mean, yes, eventually it's going to get her, you know, and stuff like that. But my mom's my mom. You call her up today, sounds like my mom, you know? Yeah. So instead of looking at the negative about it, I'm like, okay, well, if we get a year or two or whatever, let's just keep it going the best we can. And, and the other thing about you, the one thing about me that the big lesson I got taught, and that's how I communicate with God. And I do have something amazing that got downloaded to me, like you said. I really can't share it because it's amazing, but it blows my mind. And I shared it with a couple of people uh, because I might do something with it. Yeah. Um, but but uh, um, but it, 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 they, they're blown away that it was just downloaded to my mind. So I, I get what you're saying about the download. But I didn't have any intuition before I fell. Right. And, and the, the first time the intuition happened when I was able to move on my own and, you know, get my own car and drive, I didn't, I ignored it and I went metal detecting. Well, it was the worst day of metal detecting I ever had. And because I ignored my intuition, I was supposed to go somewhere and it was downloaded to me, you know, intuition wise, go. And I ignored it and the day was horrible. And um, I didn't get hurt and like that. I, I might've broke something, no fines, nothing good. And, you know, I think the bugs were bad, that kind of day, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I realized when I got home after that, like, oh, maybe I should have paid attention to where I was supposed to do. And the next time it came, I was going to go metal detecting again, the funny part. And then I said, no, no. And my kids were going to go metal detecting with me because they don't really love it, but they go now and then. And I said, nope, change of plans. We're going to go down to this brain injury, walk on the bridge. This is walkway across the Hudson Bridge. And we're going to go there because that's what they told me to go. Who told you to go? Don't worry about it. We're going. And it was the most incredible day. I met people that were supposed to meet me. Uh, and I met people that I was supposed to meet. Yeah. It goes both ways. You, 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 need, to be filled up, you need to be filled up as much as they need you to fill them up. Yeah. And it was an incredible day. And ever since then, I've known to, you know, when the intu intuition knocks, you, you do what you're told. And, you know, and it always turns out incredible. It's like speaking. It's like I never real quick when I do inspirational speaking and maybe it's bad and I do talk. I, I went to Virginia Beach to speak. and. Uh, they did say, man, you're some storyteller, you know, because I could talk. But anyway, but I never, and I know it's bad, and the professional speakers will be like, no, that's horrible. I have not prepared one speech. I leave, right. it up to, I leave it up to the higher power. I leave it up to God, and I speak. And why I bring that up is every speech I do, it's all different, and something always comes up that, change, that really helps somebody. Yeah. I say something. I spoke at this Christian school, real quick, real example, 14-year-olds, uh, Christian, they're like 12 to 14, and there was like 80 of them, and uh, they were pretty noisy to start and stuff like that when it was part of their mass or something like that. Anyway, so I ended up speaking, and I, I, they were good. They, I have to say, they all listened and stuff like that, and I told them about my son James and Robert dying, and I think that kind of hit home to them because they're kids and stuff. And then little did I know afterwards, this girl came up crying with a teacher because her brother had just died like four months ago. And uh, she was a young girl and you could tell she could just use a hug. So I asked the teachers, I said, you know, I'm a grown man. Is it okay mm -hmm. I hug her? And they said, yeah, you can hug her. We're, we're right here with you. I didn't want no problems. Yeah. And so I hugged her and, and made her day. And she's like, you know, and then I said, hey, by the way, I know it's just a book, but would it be okay if I go out in the car and get a book and I just sign it and give it to her? And they're like, get it. And she was, she says, Oh, that'd be the girl kind of smile and said, would you, that'd be great. And so I went and got it and gave it to her. I never know if I read it or I don't know anything that happened to it. And I gave it to her. And yet she was the only one in the whole place. You know, they got a book, not that that's special, but you know what I mean? It's just kind yeah. of, she needed so, to hear that message. Yeah. So it, it, it's like everywhere I go, you know, and uh, somebody comes up to me or I get an email or all these interviews I do. Sure, there's people that say, you know, you're a babbling idiot or whatever like that, you know, but that's that's fine. I don't care. You know, everybody has their own opinions. And I'm OK with it, you know, but uh, but there's one message that that really hits home and stuff, you know, and you get an email and stuff like that. So, yeah, and that's connection. I think that's why we're here is the love and connection and um, nothing's perfect, but it is it is helpful if we can take our dark times and 
use them to inspire others, which is why I do this podcast. So I want to thank you so much for your time and energy in sharing your truth, your story. And I really hope that it helps. I think it will. I mean, I know it will I, um, inspire people and let them know that there is hope and that we can get through the tough times and that there is more to life than this. So Jim, Bubba, thank you so much for being here. I really thank appreciate you, it. Um, and Thanks. I'm going to have links to your book below. And um, I just wish you all the best. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful, Shannon. My thank pleasure. You. Thank yep. you.